third priorities that the United States, Germany and France each see on the agenda, on the transatlantic agenda. But what about the role of two large international organizations which are at the center of any, inter, any transatlantic partnership, the EU and NATO? Wir leben in einer Welt, in der es auf Partner ankommt. Wir erleben derzeit gewaltige Veränderungen. Wir wissen, dass wir noch mehr tun müssen, gerade wir Deutschen. Aber die Last zu verteilen auf mehrere Schultern ist nicht nur eine Frage. Thank you so much, I don't believe in Europe alone as I don't believe in America alone. I believe in Europe and America together. Next segment of our program is devoted to the European Union and to NATO, the key defining institutions uh, that help us navigate through the crisis of the past and of the future. It's my great pleasure now to welcome the President of the Commission of the European Union, Ursula von der Leyen, who has, in fact, participated in every single Munich Security Conference since 2014. Uh, without further ado, uh, I don't want to uh, lose more time here. Over to you, Madam President, you have the floor. Thank you so much, lieber Wolfgang Ischinger, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, I vividly remember how two years ago Joe Biden promised at the Munich Security Conference, we will be back. And indeed, we've just seen and heard it, the US is back. And as we've also just heard, more globally committed than ever. This commitment couldn't come at a better time. How we come out of this crisis will have profound consequences for our citizens, for our economies, and also for the position of our common alliance in the post-COVID world. And let me give you two examples for what could be driving our new global agenda. The first example is climate change. Climate change is the looming crisis behind COVID. And the loss of biodiversity is a main driver of today's and potentially future pandemics. More than a year ago, Europe has said that it wants to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And with our European Green Deal, we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% already by 2030. But to successfully fight global climate change, we need others to match our ambition. And they do. From South Korea to Japan, from South Africa to China. And we are really excited that President Biden rejoined the Paris Agreement on his very first day in office. Because the United States is our natural partner for global leadership on climate change. And I'm sure a shared transatlantic commitment to a net zero emissions pathway by 2050 would make climate neutrality a new global benchmark. And it would be a timely message in the run up to the COP26, the next UN climate change conference to be held in Glasgow later this year. We've just heard it. I also commend President Biden's initiative to host a climate leaders summit on Earth Day because now is the time for action. And this is also true when it comes to the digital world and the impact it has on our democracies. And this is my second example. The storming on the US Capitol was a turning point for our discussion on the impact social media have on our democracies. This is what happens when words incite action. 
In a world where polarizing opinions are the most likely to be heard, it is only a short step from crude conspiracy theories to the death of police officers. In September, the Commission launched the Digital Services Act and the Digital Market Act, our new framework for the digital market. And of course, imposing democratic limits on the uncontrolled power of the big tech companies alone will not stop political violence, but it is an important step. At its most basic, we want to make sure that what is illegal offline is also illegal online. And we want clear requirements that internet firms take responsibility for the content they distribute, promote and remove. Because we just cannot leave decisions which have a huge impact on our democracies to computer programs without any human supervision or to the boardrooms in Silicon Valley. And the latest decision on Facebook regarding Australia is just another proof for that. Today, I want to invite our American friends to join our initiatives. Together, we could create a digital economy rulebook that is valid worldwide. A set of rules based on our values, human rights and pluralism, inclusion and the protection of privacy. We need to join forces and protect these values with all our energy. Ladies and gentlemen, a more and more assertive China has shown robust economic growth in 2020, despite the pandemic. And a more and more defiant Russia continues to breach international rules at home and abroad, despite growing protests of its own citizens. It is up to us, the United States and Europe, to strengthen our cooperation again as proven and trusted partners, as indispensable allies, shoulder to shoulder. Because if we lead the way, this is not only about joining forces. This is a signal to the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Thank you very much. Uh, as you know very well, uh, we have this wonderful program, the Munich Young Leaders, which is co-organized by the Kerber Foundation. And uh, the first question that we would like to, uh, to put to you comes from uh, one of our Munich Young Leaders, from Caroline Schmutte from Germany. Caroline, please. The European Union and the United States have a long and fruitful history of cooperation. And it's great to see that energy back under President Biden. However, both sides turned recently inwards, for example, by competing against each other on vaccines. How do you plan to use this new transatlantic energy to lead the European Union out of the pandemic into a strong recovery and to tackle global issues together with the United States? Thank you, Karline, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. And indeed, first of all, the story of vaccinations for me is not one of competition. To the contrary, it is one of unprecedented cooperation. You might remember last year, Europe convened two pledging sessions with a result of 16 billion euro to fight COVID. And we were joined by more than 40 countries, but also by NGOs like Global Citizen, and uh, foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the Wellcome Trust, for example. And together, together with WHO, we put in place the ACT Accelerator and COVAX. You all know the facility where high income countries finance access to vaccines for low and middle income countries. And just two hours ago at the meeting of the G7, we doubled our funding to COVAX and it was exciting to see the pledging of the United States. Indeed, the United States are back. And uh, Europe is also the continent, that's the second aspect, that produces and exports the most vaccines to the rest of the world. 
So this also shows that we are walking the talk. We are leading by the power of our example. And finally, yes, you are right. Let's commit to invest in a strong economic recovery, a recovery that is digital and sustainable, fair and inclusive. And you heard President Biden. This is why we in Europe just built our recovery package, Next Generation EU, we call it. It's 1.8 trillion euro. It is for the European Green Deal and digitalization because uh, it's good for our transatlantic partnership, but it's also most important for our children's future we are investing in because they have a right to a modern world and a healthier planet. Thank you uh, very much. I think we have time for one last and brief question, and I'd like to go uh, to the issue of trade. Um, what are your priorities, if I may ask, for the future transatlantic trade agenda? Are you in favor, for example, of taking another shot at uh, TTIP? Or what other low-hanging fruit can you identify out there? What's your proposal? Well, a trade is a wide subject um, where we are um, having many trade agreements worldwide. And indeed, I don't think that TTIP will be revived because we will have, we, we are not there where um, the United States left us four years ago anymore. Uh, the world has changed, the United States has have changed, and Europe has changed. But let me also have a look at uh, what our, um, our impact in geopolitics is, not only on the point of trade, but also um, on other topics. So the European Union is an economic superpower. It is the most important export market on the US, India, South Africa, Russia, just to name a few. And when it comes to Africa, it's not China, but Europe is the largest economic partner by far. And we are, by the way, the number one global regulator. Just recently, we have proposed to set up, indeed, an EU-US Trade and Technology Council, because we know that those who write global rules are the ones who are shaping the future of their societies. And you heard the president, none of, us wants, none of us wants China to do this for us. So I think doing it together, shaping our trade and technology agenda is the right way to go. A new global agenda, a more globally oriented US and a more capable Europe. This is how we can tackle the challenges and Europe is ready for this. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, President von der Leyen. Uh, Actually, we stay in Brussels now and go from the Commission uh, straight to the President of the European Council. Uh, bonjour, Monsieur le Président, President Charles Michel. Um, as President of the Council, uh, as President of the Council, I need to look in this camera, right? Uh, as President of the Council, uh, Mr. President, you have the authority and the mission to pull together the 27 heads of state and government when it comes to uh, taking strategic decisions on behalf of the entire European Union. So we're all excited to hear from you, uh, Mr. President, where you see your priorities and transatlantic priorities going forward. First of all, I want to thank you, Ambassador Ischinger. It's a great initiative to bring together again transatlantic partners to discuss the great challenges ahead. In the last 75 years, the relationship between Europe and the United States has been the backbone of the rules-based international order. This partnership is underpinned by multiple pillars, our security and defense alliance through NATO, our strong economic cooperation, and of course, the rich relationship between our peoples. This is a critical time for Europe, for the United States, and for the world. And we are confronted by massive challenges. 
and this makes our alliance with the US both vibrant and vital. And again, it's more necessary than ever. This is why the European Council, all the 27 European leaders together, have reaffirmed its strategic importance. And I believe both sides now want to rejuvenate and solidify our bond, I call it a new founding pact. It's worth reflecting on what the fundamentals of this pact should be. I sum it up in three words, values, prosperity, and influence. First, our values. Together, our values are those of the free world, human dignity, democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. These values represent the cornerstone of our relationship. If our relationship went through four bump years, it was not because of differences of views or interests. These are normal. Rather, it was because respecting rules and respecting agreements were no longer a given. And that's why we appreciate the commitment expressed by President Biden. We will lead not merely by the example of our power, but by the, by the power of our example. It's precisely when we respect our common values, when we respect each other as equal partners, that we can resolve our differences. It's precisely when, we, when those values are challenged by others that we must lead by example to defend them and promote them at home and abroad. Today, recovering from COVID-19 is our first priority. And more than ever, we must show our peoples that our system of free societies and open economies works and that it works for all. We, the EU and US, need to join forces to make trade, digital development, green transition, and fair taxation contribute to greater prosperity and well-being for our citizens. We want to build back a better, fairer, and greener world for all. And this is our European ambition. And we think international cooperation is the only way to succeed. Now that America, under the Biden-Harris administration, we join this common endeavor, our alliance, along with our like-minded partners, constitutes a formidable and influential power. When we are on the same page, we have greater influence to promote democracy and drive forward our economies. Together, we are stronger to defend the rules-based international order from the attacks of autocratic regimes, whether from Russia, China, or Iran. And we are stronger to ensure peace and security. When we share the same view of prosperity and well-being, we have greater capacity to deal with major economic actors, to bring them to more fairness and reciprocity while avoiding detrimental competition between ourselves. A strong partnership needs strong partners. And that's why we in Europe are growing stronger to increase our strategic ability to act for our common values, for more prosperity and for more security. We want to be a strong and reliable partner. Let's make our partnership a powerhouse for a better world. Welcome back, America. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. But uh, if you allow, let me push you just a little bit on, um, on, on this agenda. Um, there are so many issues out there, as, has been, uh, as have been presented by President Biden, uh, by your colleague Ursula von der Leyen, uh, by Chancellor Merkel, uh, etc. cetera. Um, in your view, which ones are the sort of the single most important issues that deserve to be tackled between Brussels and Washington in the weeks, months, and hopefully the year or the two years to come? 
certainly the first priority for us is to, to work together at the international level, uh, because we think that uh, we need to work in order to, to develop more prosperity. It means that we, we need to develop the economic cooperation. And uh, Ursula gave a very good example uh, with the digital transition, the digital agenda. Uh, we think indeed that data will be the resource number one of the 21st century. And we think at the same time that we need to uh, facilitate, to encourage the exchange of data. But we think also that it's important to, to guarantee that the way the personal data will be used will be accepted by the citizens. The confidence of our citizens uh, is key for the future. On the one hand, we need to develop the innovation, to develop the prosperity based on the artificial intelligence, on the digital transition. On the other hand, we need to guarantee the fundamental freedoms, the fundamental democratic values. I think this is a, a good example uh, for strong cooperation with the United States and all the other like-minded partners. Uh, certainly, climate change is another topic. Uh, I don't speak too much about that because we know uh, that the fact that the uh, uh, United States has decided to rejoin the Paris Agreement is a very strong signal, a very strong message. And my third point is certainly the, the security topics, the geopolitical topics, China, uh, Russia, how we can uh, work together in order to make sure that we have more positive influence for a better world and in order to promote our strong uh, democratic values. Thank you very much, uh, President Michel. I really appreciate your willingness to participate in this program this afternoon. We, I, I'm sure we could continue for 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 lengthy more questions, but we've actually run out of time. Uh, I regret with President Macron, we had the same problem a few minutes ago. So thank you very, very much for your willingness and we will see you again in the Munich Security Conference going forward, I'm quite sure. So now we stay in Brussels actually, but we go from the European Union to NATO. And um, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome a good old friend, if I may uh, call him that, of the Munich Security Conference, the Secretary General of NATO, uh, Jens Stoltenberg. Welcome, Jens. I'm delighted that you uh, uh, are able to join us also today in this rapid fire program. Uh, you've just hosted NATO defense ministers with the new US uh, Secretary of Defense in his first appearance uh, at NATO. So very exciting things are going, uh, are going on. Please, Jens, share with us your vision for the future. Thank you so much, uh, Wolfgang, for that uh, kind introduction. I, I, and I'm really delighted to be part of this uh, special edition of the Munich Security Conference at an important juncture in transatlantic relations. We have heard from President Biden and from European leaders, uh, and I look forward to hosting them at our NATO summit in Brussels later this year to set a new transatlantic agenda. In recent years, we have seen differences between Europe and North America, with serious questions asked about uh, the strength of our alliance on both sides of the Atlantic and competing visions of the transatlantic relations. We now have an his historic opportunity to build a stronger alliance, to regain trust and to reinforce our unity. Europe and North America working together in NATO, in strategic solidarity. Because we are facing great challenges, the rise of China, sophisticated cyber attacks, disruptive technologies, climate change, Russia's destabilizing behavior, and the continuing threat of terrorism. No country and no continent can go it alone. On the contrary, we must do more together. And we have to demonstrate our commitment to transatlantic solidarity, not just in words, but in deeds. That is why, under the banner of uh, NATO 2030, we are working on an ambitious agenda for the future of our alliance. First, we must reinforce our unity. 
That unity derives from our promise to defend each other. We must strengthen our commitment to our collective defence and fund more of deterrence and defence on NATO territory together. This would incentivize allies to provide the necessary capabilities and contribute to fairer burden sharing. NATO is the unique platform that brings Europe and North America together every day. Allies should commit to consult on all issues that affect our security. We should update NATO's strategic concept to chart a common course going forward and reaffirm the fundamentals of our alliance. Second, we must broaden our approach to security. Our potential adversaries use all the tools at their disposal military, political, economic, to challenge our institutions, weaken our societies and undermine our security. Of course, to keep our people safe, we need strong military, but we also need strong societies. As our first line of defence, we need a broader, more integrated and better coordinated approach to resilience. With concrete national targets for communications, including 5G and undersea cables, energy and water supplies, and a joint assessment of any vulnerabilities. We also need to invest to maintain our technological edge, ensure our forces remain interoperable and develop ethical standards on the use of new disruptive technologies. Broadening our approach to security also means addressing the security impact of climate change. I believe NATO should set the gold standard on how to reduce the emissions of our militaries contributing to the goal of net zero. And third, Europe and North America must defend the international rules-based order, which is being challenged by authoritarian powers. China and Russia are trying to rewrite the rules of the road to benefit their own interests. The rise of China is a defining issue for the transatlantic community with potential consequences for our security, our prosperity and our way of life. This is why NATO should deepen our relationships with close partners like Australia and Japan and forge new ones around the world. Only through concerted action can we encourage others to play by the rules. <clears throat> Defending our rules Defending our rules-based orders starts by defending our values at home. We must recommit to our values, strengthen our democracies and protect our institutions. Because ultimately, this is what makes us who we are. For over 70 years, NATO has secured peace in the Euro-Atlantic area. Despite evolving challenges and changing political winds, our transatlantic relationship has not only endured, it has flourished. This is a testament to the values we share and to NATO, the embodiment of our transatlantic bond. We all have a responsibility to seize this moment, to strengthen that bond, and to keep Europe and North America together in strategic solidarity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Um, I know you are familiar with our Munich Young Leaders Group, and you will probably not, sur not be surprised that we have young leaders even at NATO. Um, the first question, therefore, will be asked by one of our young leaders who happens to be working at the Polish mission 
uh, to NATO. This is my friend uh, Dominik Jankowski. So Dominik, uh, uh, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Secretary General, in the era of great power competition, NATO needs friends and partners. But the alliance will face all the new threats. How should NATO adapt its military posture until 2030 in order to deter the challenges and threats of today and tomorrow? Secretary General, please. Well, NATO has already implemented the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense in Europe with the new battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance, including in uh, Poland. Uh, we have uh, increased the readiness of forces and uh, allies are, after years of cutting defense spending, all allies are now investing uh, in uh, more. Uh, we need also to make sure that we uh, maintain our technological edge. So anything we can do on innovation, uh, on understand the full impact of arti artificial intelligence, quantum computing, autonomous weapon systems for our security is of course also about our collective defense uh, in uh, Europe. I think the most important thing is that we stay committed to Article 5 and sending a very clear message to any potential adversary that an attack on one ally will trigger the response from the whole alliance. And that's exactly we do, uh, what we can do by further strengthening our collective defence uh, in Europe. Thank you very much. Second question comes from another young leader. Uh, Kati Piri is actually a member of the European Parliament. Uh, she's from the Netherlands. Kati, your question, please. Secretary General. This information has emerged as a crucial challenge to our democracies. Certain state actors, including Russia and China, have made use of the uncertainties of the COVID-19 pandemic to actively undermine faith in NATO and the European Union, governmental institutions and the democratic system. Now, what actions should NATO member states take to ensure the integrity of their democracies? And what additional action could be taken at the level of NATO? Secretary General, please. Well, I think the use of disinformation is just one example of how our adversaries are using the whole range of the tools for their disposal. Military means, economic means, political means, but also uh, disinformation. And, uh, of course, we need to respond to that. Uh, by, uh, by focusing more on the resilience of our societies. Strong societies are less vulnerable to disinformation. That's exactly why in the NATO 2030 agenda, resilience uh, is the first line of defence and something we are focusing on as we prepare for the upcoming summit uh, later on this uh, year with all the NATO leaders. But fundamentally, I think that the best way to respond to disinformation is to make sure that we have a free and independent press, journalists that ask the different uh, and difficult uh, questions that are able to check their sources and make sure that this information never uh, uh, prevails. The truth will prevail as long as we have a free and independent press. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one or two uh, brief additional questions. Uh, let me ask one um, on the the relationship between NATO and the European Union. I know, uh, Jens, that you have been very, very strongly engaged in creating better institutional uh, uh, and operational links between the two organizations. Uh, describe to us, if you could, in a few words, uh, how you see this going forward. And could close NATO-EU cooperation also provide the kind of framework for for all of us meeting the challenge of China, because I'm not, not so sure everybody will want to have only NATO as the organization responsible for handling this relationship, and maybe only the European Union will also not be sufficient to cover the whole ground. Please. Over the last years, we have been able to lift the cooperation between uh, NATO and the European Union up to unprecedented levels. And I really welcome that. 
And that's uh, because of the political will from the European Union side and from the uh, NATO side. We work on issues like uh, cyber fighting terrorism, uh, uh, exercises, maritime security and on many other uh, issues. And I think that in the future we will need even more cooperation, NATO and the European Union. You mentioned the security impact of the rise of China and you are absolutely right. Neither NATO nor the European Union uh, has uh, all the tools we need uh, to address the consequences of the rise of China. We need to work uh, together. Resilience, technology, also areas where there is obvious need for more cooperation between uh, uh, EU and, and, and the European and, and NATO. And I also very much support and welcome uh, the efforts by the European Union on defence. Uh, because I really believe that more EU efforts on defence can uh, provide new capabilities, uh, can uh, try to reduce the fragmentation of the European defence industry, which will be good for all of us, and can also uh, increase defence uh, spending. So this is something uh, I support and encourage and welcome very much. Increased defence spending, for instance, in Europe is something that NATO has been calling for for many, many years. Now, actually, it happens. But, but EU cannot replace NATO. Um, uh, EU cannot protect Europe. Uh, this is partly about resources. 20% of NATO's defence spending is coming from EU NATO allies. It's also part about geography, uh, Norway and Iceland in the north, or Turkey in the south, or in the west, the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom. These countries are, of course, important for the defence, the protection of Europe. And thirdly, it's about politics. Uh, any, any attempt to weaken the transatlantic bond will not only weaken NATO, it will also uh, divide Europe. So we have to have Europe and North America together in NATO. That's the best way, uh, and especially in light of the rising uh, challenges related to terrorism, cyber, but not least uh, the changing uh, global balance of power with the rise of China. And we are very much together. We have to remember that more than 90% of the people living in the European Union, they live in a NATO country. So we really have to work together. And we have a unique opportunity now to strengthen that cooperation, a new transatlantic chap chapter. I think the message in this conference today has been exactly that, a positive message about working together. And as Secretary General of NATO, I welcome that very much. Jens, I think I have time for one last question. Um, normally, when we meet at the Munich Security Conference, you would be talking to an expert group of uh, foreign ministers and national security advisors. Today, of course, this program is being broadcast to the wider public. So I'm going to ask you a question that I think is of interest to the wider public. Our previous speakers spent a lot of time talking about climate change, the, the challenge of it that is one of the biggest challenges uh, for the global community. Any role for NATO in climate change? Yes, absolutely. And again, our NATO 2030 agenda is how to make uh, climate change and the security impact of climate change uh, an important, uh, more important uh, uh, issue for NATO. Um, in my previous capacity, before I became Secretary General of NATO, actually my, my, uh, I, I had the privilege of uh, being the UN Special Envoy on climate change. And therefore, uh, I, I see the, very clearly the relationship between, between climate change uh, and uh, security. Uh, we often say that global warming, uh, more extreme weather, that's a crisis multiplier. And crisis creates threats, and therefore climate change matters for our security. NATO has at least three things we should do. First, we need to fully understand the security consequences, assess, map, uh, analyze the security co consequences, we should be the organization bringing Europe and North America together to, to have uh, the expertise, uh, the, the knowledge on, on the security consequences of climate change. Second, we need to adapt our missions and operations. Uh, we know that a lot of military infrastructure will be directly impacted by global warming, rising sea levels. Uh, so this will have direct consequences for how we invest, where we can have our bases, especially naval bases. Uh, but also, for instance, we have now we are now increasing our training mission in Iraq. In Iraq, in Baghdad last summer, it was more than 50 degrees Celsius for many, many days. 
Of course, this will impact the way we organize our missions, equipment, uniforms, ice is melting, it impacts how we can operate in the high north. So climate change is directly impacting our missions and operations. We need to adapt to that. And thirdly, NATO should be part of the solution. We have a responsibility to contribute to reduced emissions. And therefore, I think that our militaries, NATO, should aim at uh, becoming part of the net zero uh, uh, goal. Uh, and uh, uh, this is therefore one of my proposals for the heads of state and government, that actually we should make climate change an important issue. Reduce emissions from military operations is a way to uh, address climate change, but actually less dependence on fossil fuels would also make our military operations more resilient and reduce vulnerabilities. So security and climate goes hand in hand as we address it in NATO. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. This last issue, uh, of course, leads us wonderfully into the next segment. Uh, my job now is to say thank you to you. Uh, see you at our next in-person uh, Munich Security Conference. Over to Natalie.